Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to spend some time with us today. We're gonna to get started here in a minute. Uh, let some folks come into the webinar. So please get settled in, grab a glass of water and we'll get started here in just a minute. All right, it's 12.01, let's get started. Thank you again, everybody, for spending some time with us this afternoon. Uh, today, we're doing an Ask Me Anything with William Tin Cup. I'll tell you more about William here in a second, but before we get started, thank you once again for taking the time to join us. Uh, one big difference today compared to every other webinar that sends hosts, this is 100% meant for you. This is a hyper-personalized, a hyper-intimate event. We've only invited just a few people to this event. So please don't be quiet at all. You know, this is essentially an ask me whatever is on your mind from an, from an HR tech standpoint, from recruiting, talent acquisition, talent engagement, anything that you want to get answered from William, who's obviously an industry expert. Uh, you know, start shouting those questions out in the Zoom chat box. You know, we'll absolutely make sure we get to all of your questions. We also have some questions that, you know, during the registration process itself, we uh, were sent over to us. So we have some questions to get started, but we're absolutely going to keep this open up to the audience uh, to just, you know, talk about whatever is on your mind. With that, uh, let me start by introducing our guest for the afternoon. Uh, William, if you don't mind joining us, there he is. Well, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know William already, and which is why you're in this webinar in the first place. William's an industry expert. Uh, but just to tell you a little bit more about William for people who don't know him, uh, he's the president and editor in large of Recruiting Daily, which is at the intersection of work and technology. William's a writer, a speaker, and advisor, a storyteller. I mean, you can Google him and you'll find thousands of uh, pieces of information about him. What is most exciting to me is that, first of all, William is an advisor to about 20 plus HR tech startups, including Sense. So he really cares about this space. He really has a very broad uh, experience in this space, which means he can also bring, you know, a well-rounded perspective on something that has been bugging you for weeks or months or so on and so forth. And second, he's been doing this a long time. He's been doing this for over 20 years, which means, you know, he's gone through multiple different trends and buzzwords, multiple different recessions and boom times. Um, so, you know, every time I have a conversation with William, I absolutely love his perspective, which is not just based on what's happening in the last three months, so on and so forth. So anyway, that's a quick introduction. Uh, feel free to start dropping your questions in the chat box. I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to stop sharing the slide deck so you guys can just see, uh, you know, William up close and personal, uh, and we can essentially have a conversation. William, so happy to have you here. Welcome. I get to thank you so much for uh, putting this together. I love AMAs. Uh, my week, if I were to share my calendar, which I won't, but if, if I were to share my calendar, it's split basically um, probably do about 15 to 20 podcasts a week. And those are split. Half of them are with vendors and, and half of them are with practitioners. And I th think the other day I was trying to count up how many podcasts I've done. It was, it was close to 2000. And uh, it was one of the reasons I did started podcasting back in 2010 was to learn HR and recruiting from a practitioner's point of, point of view. And uh, I did uh, probably five years. It was a daily. So two things you should never do with a podcast is a daily and live. So never, that's advice uh, for everyone listening. Just it's a horrible experience, but I learned a lot. And uh, the podcasts I do now are recorded, but I get to talk to practitioners every single day. Like today, 
I've already talked to three different global heads of talent acquisition. And the what's what's what I find the rich tapestry of both HR and TA is like we want to simplify things. We want to take things that are really complex and make them really simple. And uh, and there's nothing in TA that's simple. And uh, and it was just it's just fascinating. So one of the things was when we were putting this together is we could have easily put a webinar together. I mean, you know, package up a, a nice webinar, some thought leadership. But we wanted to do something different. We want to kind of do this routinely where we just talk and answer questions. And so I think the the format is is it lends itself to the interaction with people and the problems and then not, not problems, but the things that are on their mind. So you, you can't be wrong. So this is not like a conference. You don't have to raise your hand. If, if you, we, we do have some questions that, that, that have were submitted, so we'll start with those. But the value to everyone, because if you have a question, chances are someone else in the audience has the exact same question. They just haven't asked, asked it. Um, but but it, or it might trigger another question that you wanted to ask. So we're up for just as like it says, AMA, ask me anything. We're up for anything. So there's nothing off limits. You can ask us anything. And uh, so let's let's start with the, the first question that's submitted. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. And uh, I'll encourage folks to keep submitting questions as we go along. But, you know, uh, we've taken a few of the questions that we got during the registration process, William, and we bucketed them into a few categories. So they, they might feel like they're coming category after category. But the first one was a lot about AI. I mean, you know, just people wanting to know what exactly is AI and how does AI really work in the recruiting industry? How does it take shape or form within our industry? So, <laughs> so we'll start off with something uh, traumatic um, in, in the sense of you shouldn't care. Uh, and so <laughs> I'll start with this. And this is why I think this, because as a former and recovering marketer, uh, I would tell you that I could, we, could, we could market AI, machine learning, NLP, all of these things. And you'll go down this rabbit hole of trying to figure out what those things are, how they're different, how they're similar, how they'll affect you, et cetera. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, is what's the outcome of those technologies and how does it impact uh, your constituents being sourcers or hiring managers or candidates or recruiters, et cetera. So um, I'll frame it this way. Everyone knows what a Tesla is. Everyone, some of you might even have Teslas. Everyone's used Google Maps or Alexa or Siri, and no one knows how those things work. You, you can't find a Tesla owner that actually knows how it works. Like you, we just trust that it works. Uh, Google Maps, same thing. You just put in a location, put directions and just yeah, assume that there's something underneath there that makes sense of where we're supposed to drive to. That's how we should be looking at AI and machine learning in recruiting and talent acquisition in general. You shouldn't care. Like the, the fact that a vendor or a supplier will t or partner will say, oh, this is real AI or this, that or the other. It's cool. Like you know, the car's gray. All right, well, so what? How does it impact you in the experiences that you want to create for your team and for your candidates? That's what you care about. And that's what you should care about. So um, a couple of years ago, attending HR Tech in Vegas, I literally went booth to booth and counted how many vendors that actually marketed themselves with AI. And it was close to about 80%. This is 19 uh, 2019, so the last age in person HR uh, uh, HR tech that I went to, and uh, and I thought to myself, well, first of all, why is that important? Like we don't do that with other parts of our lives. We don't care how things. We turn on a faucet. Does anyone has anyone been to a water treatment plant? Like, do we actually know how water is created? Uh, and and get it, it goes through our faucet? No, we don't care. We we shouldn't care. We just hit the faucet and water comes out. So I think I think. As I look at the question, I'll start off with, again, something fairly traumatic uh, for a lot of folks. You just shouldn't care. You should care about the outputs or the outcomes of 
what would be the technology, whether or not it's an AI uh, or, 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 or machine learning or natural language processing or whatever it is, doesn't matter. It matters, it matters not. It matters as to the experience and the outputs that, that is created by, those, that, by that technology. Now, what do you see? I mean, because that's, that's a bit obtuse as a, from a perspective because TA and HR are inundated with marketing messages and sales messages about AI. And it's my belief that if you, if you in fact, I did this at a conference just recently, if you literally pull a person in talent acquisition aside and go, okay, I'm going to give you 10 terms. Tell me the difference between these. Crypto, Bitcoin, NFT, AI, blockchain, this, that, the other, and define them. Just one sentence. It doesn't have to be something elaborate. Just to define them. You can't find a talent acquisition professional that can actually define them, and nor should they. <laughs> so, so again, like, why are we asking them to learn something that they shouldn't care about? So again, it's a bit obtuse, a bit stark to start off with, but that's my take. Yeah. And, you know, I, I agree with that. I mean, I hear when a lot of people talk about AI, they start thinking about, is it going to take my job away? Is it something right. to be scared about? And, you know, I always tell people that it's not you know, human versus AI, it's human and the AI versus the problem. Like, you know, if you can solve the problem faster, more elegantly, have a seamless transfer between the human being and AI and bring it back to the human being for things that human beings are good at, I mean, you're probably going to be better off than any of your peers or competitors in the industry. I think you're, I think you're spot on. It's, it's looking at where, because time is finite, where can you get time back? And where, where can something be automated and the experience still be a great experience for everyone involved? So we're not, we don't want to suffer anything on the experience side. We don't want the experience to be lesser. Uh, so we want like, with, you know, candid scheduling, right? It's really, this is table stakes at this point. There was a point in time where we would have people that were full time that would do nothing but candid, candid scheduling. Okay. We don't need to have that anymore. That's right. This, there's a, there, there's a bot that can actually do that more efficiently and more effectively and a better experience for everybody involved. Now, what we do is instead of letting that candidate scheduler go, we can retool that person, retrain them and refocus them on another part of the journey that's really human centric and should be more human centric. So we garner and give, gather time by automation and then use that time appropriately where we need to go deep. So instead of a 15 minute interview, we can actually have a 45 minute interview with it, with a candidate and go deep and really understand the fit. And, and we couldn't do that before if, we, if, 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 if things aren't automated. So I think you look for automation and you're, this is going to be from here forth. You look for automation to automate the things in your life and in talent acquisitions in particular that you just don't need to do like you just don't need to do and it's in and and you're going to have a better life by not doing them the right. candidate's going to have a better experience by you not doing those things yeah and william one of the follow-ups we had on ai uh, itself was now that there are ai powered talent engagement platforms you know the ones we're just talking about right how do talent acquisition teams look like five years from now? Oh, I think more of uh, the TA uh, focus is going to be on data and data-driven decisions. And so I think what you'll see in TA is, is a switch of really essentially what you've seen in marketing over the last 20 years is it went from art to science and recruiting is still going to be art. Uh, there's, we're not going to get rid of, nor should we get rid of the art part of recruiting, but it's going to be more science. And I think what you'll, what you'll find is we'll enjoy it a lot more because we're not going to be down into the, the, the tactics of things that we just shouldn't be doing. So I think what, what I'm looking forward to uh, with TA teams is being able to talk to TA leaders and them going, okay, I know exactly what's going on in my funnel. I know exactly like, okay, I could pull this lever. And I, did, I, couldn't, I didn't know that before. I couldn't have the insight into that before. And, or I was too much in the weeds to actually understand what the data was trying to tell me. Whereas now I'm looking at data 
constantly and I know what levers, I know what works right. and what doesn't. Right, 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 right. Yeah, totally makes sense. Um, you know, the the other thing that's related to this, William, is, I mean, obviously we're sort of barely coming out of the pandemic, but, you know, through this entire pandemic, we kept, you know, seeing headlines about the war for talent, you know, severe talent shortage, so on and so forth. What's your take on, you know, what the talent market looks like now and how would sort of hiring teams and recruiters adjust their sort of recruiting strategies going forward okay so not not as not as blunt as the first uh question but close so we tend to think hr and ta in general we tend to think in months weeks and days and the candidates uh covid has taught us a lot of lessons but one of the lessons that we've learned is, is that candidates think in minutes uh, hours and seconds or hours, minutes and seconds, if you want to do it that way in descending order. So we speak in different time lapses, right? Like when we think, okay, and we think we're going fast, we're going, okay, we're reviewing your resume. We'll get back to you in three days. Like that sounds to normal people in corporate recruiting. Oh yeah, that sounds reasonable to a candidate. That's absolutely unreasonable. It means you, do, you, you don't care about me. Or worse than that, they judge you based on your inability to be fast. So this is, this is, this is harsh, y'all. So this is like, um, you know, being on, a, being on a website and a chatbot opens up and it's like, hey, can we help you with anything? And then you hit something in there and it takes them 10 minutes to respond to you. Well, we're judging, like we quietly, like from Magnolia and Tom Cruise, we're quietly judging that that technology and that company. Candidates are judging us based on speed, which we haven't been judged on as much. Uh, if you do if price, quality, and speed is a triangle, we've been we've been judged more on quality, and uh, you miss candidates. So. Here's the, here's the impact to the pipeline. If you don't respond, fast, if you don't reorient the team and yourself to speed, then you're not going to get quality because quality will opt out of your process. So they'll apply and then you won't get back to them. You won't send them the assessment or the screen or whatever the next step is, or you won't tell them what the next step is in the process and they're gone. They're out of the process. By the time you get back to them, they already have four offers and probably have accepted a job. So if you want quality candidates in any, in any regard, if you want quality candidates, you've got to reorient the entire team around speed and you've just got to be faster. And, I, and, it, and, and that's a re-engineering of process, of technology. It's a re-engineering of our, or just a way that we think about how we interact with, like, you can't go too fast, which I think is sometimes a natural worry that people have. It's like, well, if I go too fast, then the candidates that might think that we're, we, we don't care. It's like, you know what? Error on the side of we're going to go fast. And if they want to slow things down, cool. But you want to be as fast as your candidates. And right now, no one in our space is as fast as candidates. They expect stuff in seconds. Like, it's crazy. And I, when people are here listening to this, they're going to go, no, William, you just can't be right. Yeah, I am. It's, it's, it's insane. That's their expectation. So what do we learn from COVID? Everyone reevaluated life. Okay, so there's that. That's a, kind of, that's a little meta. But more importantly, with the, the candidate, whether or not we're in a candidate-centric uh, market or employer-centric market, this won't change. That this this is talent now has cha has changed forever in the sense of they expect things faster than we're willing or able to deliver. Yeah, so I think I hundred percent agree with that. In fact, I preach this all the time. Sounds like our audience agrees. Frank just said, you know, right on. <laughs> uh, but you know, I'll, when I think about job seeker experience, this is what we talk a lot with our customers about. You know, number one is speed, right? I mean, there is just no substitute for speed. 
especially in the world we live in today where there is clearly a talent shortage, where people have more options than one, you know, so on and so forth. The second thing we talk about is just an experience that is always on. You know, you can no longer be, well, my company's open nine to five or my recruiters talk to you from nine to five. You know, I talk a lot about consumerization of talent acquisition where people expect the same uh, experience from your website as they expect from amazon.com. 100%. I can just go there whenever, buy something in 15 seconds and be done with it. So, you know, I mean, throughout the pandemic, we saw hundreds of customers telling us that the people they are hiring for, nurses, are only getting a break at midnight. They can't ever talk to a recruiter. So who are they going to talk to? So, you know, they're talking to a bot. They're getting through their screening questions. And you talked about this before, which is scheduling. They're self-scheduling themselves, which means... Right. They've looked at every one of their constraints and said, I am available at 3 p.m. on Thursday. I'm likely to show up. If a recruiter tells me, hey, can you talk on Thursday at 3 or Friday at 3? I might agree to one of those times, but then life gets in the way because I haven't planned for my babysitter or my daycare pickup or whatever. But if I pick a time, I'm just going to make that happen. So automatic scheduling actually leads to like 98% of the people showing up. And there are so many stats around how it takes six to seven emails to schedule one meeting. They, right. all, go, they all go away. Oh, no, they're gone. The, uh, you know, the interesting uh, thing that you bring up is uh, the consumerization. So everyone has their smartphone, right? And I think texting actually is one of the things that, that, that even if you don't like texting, uh, there's, a, there's a feeling of texting. When you text someone, you expect them to respond. <laughs> like even if it's even if it's hey i got your note uh i'm i'm i'm, I'm you know in the water right now and, uh, and i can't get back to you but but I, I you get a response and i think in you know if you don't get a response from somebody you're like what's going on with this <laughs> why why is it this person pushing the button and answering my question that's what they're doing with our with our recruitment process and i i think you know, it's hard. So first of all, we're, as we talk about this, there's nothing easy about reorienting the way that we dance. Because the way that we were taught dance, whether or not it's line dancing or pick your favorite foxtrot or whatever dance, there's a, typically there's a lead and a follow. Yep. And we've been taught historically in recruiting that corporate leads and candidates follow. That's just kind of how we grew up. Like, okay, this, this is the kind of natural that you set the agenda and the process and they kind of, you know, go through the, your process. Yeah, that's gone. <laughs> that's just <laughs> gone. They lead and it's our job to then follow them and make it a world-class experience for them uh, or we won't get to them. So, you know, if you, if you, it's one of those kind of adapt or die types of things. If we don't, adapt then we're just not going to we're going to wake up with a peter principle where we don't have the talent that we want because we didn't adapt right 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 okay so i'm going to flip this around a little bit now sure. you know on the flip side of hiring there is retention right i mean um it's hard to find talents which means we should be doubling down our efforts to keep the talent especially keep the good talent that you have so, you know, what are some strategies people should think about when it comes to retention? Maybe some strategies that are currently underrated, but like, what are some of the things folks can do to make sure that they don't lose talent? So I, I don't believe, uh, again, kind of hot, hot topic. I don't, I don't believe in exit interviews or stay interviews conceptually. I just think that they're a waste of time. Uh, at, and so in general, I just don't think of them highly. I think better than any of those things is calibration and uh, weekly calibration. So more frequently, again, we're doing a speed in a way, but more frequently a manager and an employee or two teammates, if you will, calibrating and constantly recalibrating the experience. How are you doing? How's your workload? What's going well? What's not going well? What are you learning? What do you need to learn? Constantly. Again, always on to your point earlier, this is something if we really want to get retention right, retention is not a bespoke moment in time. Hmm. Retention is something we do every minute of the day. That's if we want to retain talent, 
and then, then it's an always on kind of mentality and we're constantly calibrating and recalibrating and there, there might not be much to move, but it, we're always talking and we're always listening to employees. Most of that is listening, it, but you got to ask the question, you got to set the time, you got to you got to care enough as a manager uh, of your span of control to then talk to people and go, hey, what's important to you? What's going on in your life? You know, work, work aside. Your kid's going to a basketball tournament. You're on a traveling team. Like, tell me a little bit more about that. Like, what's going on? The more you do that with employees, regardless of where they sit in the organization, the better chance you have of keeping them because they know that you care about them as a human being. And I think that you're seeing more of that on the front end in talent acquisition work. Candidates are making judgments about, are you human centric? Are you people centric? And if you're not, like I can go work somewhere and get a check doing something else. So I want, I want, I want someone that actually cares about me and not just my work me, but all of me. Right, 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 right. So, you know, William, thinking about everything you've said so far, you know, there is this aspect of sort of talent attraction and hiring. There is this aspect of talent retention you know, sounds to me like both of these come down to the same thing, which is engagement, right? I mean, just engaging with your talent, whether they were top of the funnel or whether they're already working for you. So, you know, and we'll probably call one of them as candidate engagement and one of them right. as employee engagement, but, you know, it's the same human engagement. So maybe sort of like talk about that a little bit more, like what's working in those and what's what's not working, what's the toolbox, how do these things differ? Like how does one do best practices around that? Engagement on both sides is, is an exercise in meeting them where they are. So in candidates, um, if finding out what's important to them, like if it's texting, like, uh, like, okay, I'll just give myself an example. I'm horrible at voicemails. Hmm. So, right? I'm just horrible. If you leave me a voicemail, you have a better chance of seeing a smoke signal from me than, than a response. I'm just horrible at it. I've always been horrible at it. Uh, and so I, I don't see myself at, at this point in my life changing. Now, I'm great at email. Oddly enough, same exact thing. If someone sends me the exact same note and they send me via email, I'm a zero inbox guy. I will get to that email and I will get a response out but a voicemail might linger on my phone <laughs> for a month before I get to it. So again, I'm not the audience in this sense, but when you think about candidates, they're that unique that they, they have quirks, they have uh, preferences in the way they like to communicate. And so consultants have this phrase of where the rubber meets the road, which of course is cliche, but, it's, it is kind of an exercise in meeting them where they, where they are. So again, it's, it's change on our part. Like we've, we've hit this kind of hard. It's change. Our, we have to change. So instead of inspecting the audience candidates in this case or employees in this case, for them to change and to somehow be forced into our construct, we have to change and then go and meet them where they are and understand what's important to them. So I think asking them questions like, like on the candidate side, it's like, hey, listen, here's the process. In fact, I heard something the other day, which I found devastating, but probably true. It was, it was from an engineering friend of mine. And he said, listen, the first question I ask a recruiter is how many steps in your process? If it's more than five steps in a process, I'm not interested. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's a little harsh. He's like, yeah, but here's the deal. They don't have their stuff together. That's what it's telling me. They don't have their, their stuff together and they're going to waste my time. Yeah, it might be a great job, but I don't want to waste my time. Life's too short. It's like, okay, okay. So setting the table with candidates so that you understand what's important to them is an exercise in asking those questions. Like, hey, how do you like to communicate? You know, you, we, I, I'd be like, I can, you know, can leave you voicemails. I can text you. I can email you. Like, what do you like? What's the frequency? So that I understand better, like how, do you, how fast do you want to move? Because like we can move fast. You want to move slower? You want to do things? Uh, we've, uh, let me tell you a little bit about our hiring process. Here's what you'll go through if you choose to go through. We'd love for you to go, choose, to go through this process. Here's our process. We don't do enough of that. 
of kind of the empathy around their needs in the process. And, and again, we're now at a kind of a point where we have to change. It's nice if, if, if we were in a different market where we, we could change because we just wanted to have better candidate experience, a better candidate journey or employee experience, employee journey. But now we're forced to because we either don't get the talent on the attraction side or the talent leaves us on the retention side. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think something you said, uh, you know, is what I deeply believe in, which is just like an omni-channel strategy. Now you absolutely have to meet people where they live. Uh, this whole concept of you're going to have tens of thousands of candidates slash employees to engage with. You have to take their preferences into account. Hey, email me, don't text me or text me, don't email me. Reach out to me during work hours, reach out to me after hours. You know, right. whatever people are telling you, it's obviously super easy with technology to store these preferences and just send out a different message based on, you know, what kind of checkbox you guys ended up marking. But um, that just speaks very, very highly to me. But it's it's the mentality. It's, it's us changing our mentality around forcing them into a process that we know and love and you know, we've built and sculpted, et cetera, as opposed to us fitting into what their process, their ideal process is, which is really hard for us to get our heads around because it's the first time in history where we've had to actually think like, okay, this isn't our process. Yeah. It's our job. Yeah. Like it's our, you know, we're trying to hire for this position or we're trying to retain for this position, but it's the individual, it's the human being that we have to actually solve the algebra for. That's right. That's right. You know, Abdullah, who's in our audience today, he basically commented saying, you know, that he shared a post on LinkedIn, which essentially said, had there been a great recognition, there wouldn't, there wouldn't have been a great resignation. 100%. So, you know, uh, he also has a follow-up question for you, William. So sure. uh, he's asking, how do you overcome the challenges of sourcing a diverse talent pool? Well, I, I've, I think the, so first of all, it's a great question. And please send me the LinkedIn uh, article because I'd like to read that, uh, Abdullah. So the thing about div diversity is it starts both at the top and at the bottom of the organization. So leadership has to care about uh, the diversity and it also has to be a groundswell of people that just refuse to not be in a diverse environment. So I think one of the things is, is as a, wherever you stay, wherever you are in the talent acquisition uh, landscape, is just you're constantly talking about the, the diversity of your talent, talent pool. It's, it's just, it's a, an always on conversation. Uh, Tina Fey, I was, I was watching David Letterman and Tina Fey, uh, it was a Netflix special. Yeah, yeah. Of, next uh, guest, yeah. And my next guest needs, and she said this about writers, female writers in a writer's room. And she, was, she said this exact point is like the more female writers, then it became the more different writers. And then all of a sudden you look up and there's such a diverse group. Funny is either funny or not funny. But now you've got a better idea of what the population will find funny. So yeah. Abdullah, I think the thing is, is when you, you, you look at the entire funnel, where we tend to look at it as the slate of candidates that we pass over. So the hiring manager wants a slate of five and we give them a slate of five and it's five middle-aged pear-shaped white guys. Okay, so we failed, right? I, I fall into the, the category so I can make fun of myself. But so we, we failed because that right there, but that's the end of the funnel uh, in, a, in a sense of they're going to make a decision out of those five. We need to think of the very front of the funnel, how we're marketing, uh, whom to whom we're marketing and how we're getting, how we're doing things differently all the way out in the front of the funnel. So the front of the funnel is diverse so that through the stages that we, that all diversity is always represented, which means it's always on and we're always thinking about how can we do things differently? Like, uh, can we, can we go to HBCUs and, and, and rent space in their newsletters? You know, can we, can we, can we do something completely out of the box? Because if we can continue to do the same things that we've done, we're going to get the same outcomes. And so, I, again, the pressure comes from both sides. The pressure should come from leadership to say, what are we doing? What are they, you know, programmatically, what are we doing and what are the outcomes? And then it should also be a groundswell of both employees. And you're going to also see it from candidates. Uh, because, I mean, candidates, I mean, they're harsh. They, they're judging you 
on your job description, not just on the, you know, the vernacular and the, the language and the stuff like that, but there, do you have a DNI and st- right. uh, statement in there? They're looking at your careers page and is it the same DNI statement that another company has? Or where have you, where are you showing videos of diverse candidates? You know, we're, we're in the middle of Pride Month, which Pride Month is every month uh, for, for folks that care mm-hmm. about that community. But, it, you know, this is the moment where you can actually highlight those, 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 um, those conversations and those stories. We should be always highlighting those stories. So, Abdul, great question. The, the answer lies in a mixture of the things that I've said. It's making sure because you, you can't care about diversity if your leadership team doesn't care about diversity. So that's, that's, that's going to be harsh to hear. But if your leadership and your board doesn't care, it doesn't matter what you do. Yeah, so I think, William, you're spot on. And if you would allow me a minute, I actually did a 30-minute, um, you know, essentially a Q&A and an AMA like this with a gentleman called Gabe who is running diversity initiatives at Dell. I'll, I'll ask my team to post that link in the Zoom chat here. But in about a week's time, uh, that session is going to be broadcast. You guys can all sign up for it completely free. He actually gets into very detailed discussions around, um, you know, how it's, well, first of all, exactly what you said, which is it was the number one priority by Michael Dell, the CEO of Dell. And he set up like really bold goals saying by 2030, we want 50% of our employees to be women. We want 40% of them to be, you know, Latinos, African-Americans, so on and so forth, veterans, uh, disabled folks. So, I mean, like basically he set the goal up, enabled a bunch of things. And that's what this organization is now headed towards, uh, you know, in a, t- in a 10 year lifespan. I, th- I think if you've got bold, if you've got leadership there, it, you know, you, you start with, quotas and goals which is you know a bit clunky but the idea is you're just you're starting on this journey of saying okay but really what it is is it's it's a uh, it's representative of you're just not willing to work in an environment that's not diverse yeah, yeah and yeah. so that is i think that's what's proliferating both the candidate experience and the employee experience is you're just unwilling like i don't, I don't have another job lined up but i'm just tired of this I'm not going to work in this environment that just doesn't celebrate who I am. Yeah. And that could be, you define that as you wish. And so I think that's the, the thing that we've got to kind of come to grips with is, is that's not changing. It doesn't matter what, we can go into an employer-driven market tomorrow, not changing. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a great conversation actually happening in the, in the chat, uh, I'll spare you all of that's, it. That's where all the good stuff happens. It is, but you know, somebody asked, "Do you see benefit in social media sourcing?" It's at via Facebook or Instagram, and then Owen replied saying it's very dependent on the type and level of roles. Some Facebook groups can give you CPAs, but you can't get them from any kind of advertising, so on and so forth. Abdullah's asked again, back to DEI, DEI. Do you think there should be a diversity recruiter, or should everybody focus on DEI? And Abdullah just. In the interest of time, I'll give you my three cents on it. You're going to see a link here posted shortly. And if you uh, if you grab that link and join us in a week, you're going to get a, a hundred of these questions answered from somebody whose job is to do this day in and day out. Uh, but William, I'm going to move us to the next question. Sure. Uh, this is kind of going a little bit back to what you covered already. But since sure. it's a live question, I'll take, and take it anyway. Uh, the question is, in the IT sector, do you have stats and recommendations for how long should it take from connecting with the candidate to extending an offer in a perfectly executed process? <laughs> oh, wow. Great question. And hard to, because IT can be everything from a, a data scientist to someone that manages databases and everything in between. So I think of, uh, some of it comes down to the level in which that talent is, the scarcity of which that talent is, and getting back to asking them what, how they want to how this how they want this process to run so finding out from candidates and and just uh, institutionalizing the questions in your recruitment process where you ask them hey listen we can move fast or slow it's going to be a quality experience no matter what we do how would you like for this to go like we can do this in 48 hours if you've got time we'll make time now you want this to go over two weeks because you're traveling or something else great fantastic so I think it's bespoke and highly personalized. And I think that's probably 
the hit that you're looking for in the question is it's going to be highly personalized down to the person. And that's hard because we've had a kind of a cookie cutter approach to talent, both on the employee side and the candidate side for so long that when we say highly personalized, like, oh my goodness, how are we going to do that? Well, that's, how, that's what technology does. Technology enables the highly personalized experience for candidates and employees. So, okay. So we're going to get into some sourcing, which is, I know is a big wheelhouse of yours. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've got this question from Kristen. Kristen asks, we primarily use LinkedIn for outreach and it's a mixed bag of results. <laughs> what are some other sources we can look in for qualified candidates? So I, I just did a podcast with, uh, everyone knows AngelList. Uh, it's a it's a place for startups. So AngelList has two parts. One's the capital part. The other is talent. And they've been doing talent for years now, but they've got a tool on the back end of it that's a sourcing tool. And it's called Remote. And uh, it is a fantastic candidate pool. And, and a highly engaged individuals that are looking for startup opportunities. They're talented people. And again, you could be a large company looking for somebody that's got a startup mentality, uh, great, great talent, what we'll call talent pool. Uh, and so you look for those, but the, the tools I think everyone's using right now and really in love with is, is Seek Out, Hire Easy, Source Whale, Jim, tools like that, where you can, you can use something, a tool like that to then find candidates across the internet, whether or not it's in LinkedIn, or outside of LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn, if you're doing tech in LinkedIn, I heard this a couple months ago and it, it terrified me as well, but software engineers are do pop-up LinkedIn profiles. So imagine this hell. So when they're interested in looking at opportunities, they turn their, they turn their profile on and it has all the keywords of what they've done and doing, et cetera. And they get inundated by the recruiters and then they turn their profile off. <laughs> I've been on LinkedIn since 2003. I've never turned my profile off. I don't even know that. I, I don't even know. I, I'm sure there's a way. I've never looked into it. So imagine trying to go after that talent, that type of talent, that array of talent, and them turning on and off their profiles. Like that's just, that's whack-a-mole. That's crazy. So we've got to find different tools than, than just LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn, everyone complains about LinkedIn, yet everyone uses LinkedIn. So it is kind of a, it is kind of a, we, we, we will complain about it, but at the same time, we all use it. So I think the bespoke sourcing tools, uh, I can give you a list if you want to email me, uh, but there's a bunch of great options there. Yeah, and, and you know, that's awesome. And a couple of things I was going to add was to, you know, whoever asked this question, I mean, one thing that we most often overlook is the power of your own existing candidate database. Uh, we ha absolutely have customers now who tell us that up to 50% of the people that they're hiring every year were already sitting in their database. 100%. So if you were sanitizing your database, if you're using a technology that essentially could keep their information up to date, reaches out to them automatically, if you haven't had an update in 90 days or 180 days, whatever you want, and says, hey, how much money are you looking for now? Or are you still at the same zip code? Or has anything in your life situation changed? If you just have a sanitized database, I mean, some of the companies on our call today, I just know by their names, probably have millions of candidates in their database. They're running like a mini LinkedIn all by themselves. Right. Um, if you just you know went in there, uh, you're probably going to, without even spending a ton of money, find people that you want to hire. Oh, 100%. But it's, it's the sanitation. The hard part of that for a lot of practitioners is the keeping the data up to date. And I think, again, another place for technology to do that automatically where a human's not looking that information up, uh, technology is actually doing that in the background all the time, keeping Absolutely. that up to date. Absolutely. I mean, not to, not to sort of plug in sense, but that's exactly what we've done for several of our customers. Yeah. I remember a customer where William, they had 8 million people in their database and a million of them were simply missing a zip code. 
Yep. And all the recruiters are searching for is I want somebody within 20 miles of, you know, 98014. Can't find anybody in the database. Can't find anybody, right? And then <laughs> technology just went out to those million people, 100,000 at a time over 10 days and said, guys, we're missing your zip code. Give us your zip code. Nobody thinks of this as sensitive information. Everybody's yeah. providing that information. It's automatically being written back into the applicant tracking system or CRM, whatever you're using. And boom, next day, the recruiters are doing the same search and seven more people are showing up. So right. just, you know, technology can be your friend there. Um, oh, so it has yeah. to be. And and again, it's it's the data that exists in your CRM and ATSs, and it's also in your employee populations. We haven't talked about referrals or the power of referrals, but it's That's a right. holy grail of, of HR and recruiting to enable employees to recommend. Uh, I have a, a, a recruiter friend that works for Twitter that uh, that has gotten to a point now with referrals where they go to their favorite best engineer and say, who do you want to work with? Who do you, who do you want to work with? Uh, you want to work with Lori? Fantastic. Give me Lori's email address. And they send an offer to Lori, sight unseen. Like, hey, listen, Sam says he wants to work with you. I, I trust his, I trust him as a talent uh, evaluator. So we'd love to have you at Twitter. Like it, it's that fast and that crazy that you would do that. But that's a different way of thinking about referrals. That's but there's, there's something there, there. Uh, but I love the, the, the database, the way that we've talked about databases is again, always on. Right. It runs in the background. That's right. Not, not a human being pushing buttons. Yep. All right, we've got another question from Owen uh, in the chat here said, can you create a bespoke high volume process like how Chick-fil-A has done it for fast food? Oh, absolutely. 100%. It's, it's different than uh, corporate recruiting. Uh, so sometimes uh, the, the tool set, the tool belt is different. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I can give you the tools if you want to think about it. But yes, you it's when you think of high volume and hourly, sometimes there, you, people use them as synonyms. So sometimes people say hourly and they mean high volume or high volume and they mean hourly. But essentially, if you've got a massive amount of hires, at which you're going to have with retail, you're dealing with kind of like 20% attrition. So it, it moves fast and it, it also kind of refills fast. Um, you need tools that, again, now if we're talking about speed, uh, you've got you've got to you've got to move faster, but the the key on high volume is applications that are mobile first. So whether or not it's sourcing or uh, recruitment marketing or the ATS or whatever the process is, whatever the technology is, uh, majority of the applications are going to come through the phone. So your process has to be set up to be extremely mobile friendly. Yeah, and you know, Owen, what I'll add here is because you asked this question specifically, I've seen some customers where on Friday, they'll get sort of a job order from their customers saying, hey, can you have 50 people show up in a warehouse on Monday morning? And you know, well, first of all, their entire target population, if you will, is not sitting in front of a laptop anyway. And to what William said about mobile first, they'll send out you know, 700 text messages yep. saying, we, we have a job for you on Monday morning. If you click on this link and answer a couple of questions, they click on a link that pops up a chat board. They're asking the same sort of high volume things. Are you authorized to work? Have you ever mm -hmm. gotten a felony or a DUI? Would you get a COVID screening? Can you lift 50 pounds a day? Can you stand on your feet for eight hours a day? You know, maybe do you have a driver's license or do you have a way of getting right. to the facility? And will you work for $18 and 22 cents? Because that's exactly what I'm going to pay. Not a cent less, not a cent more. And if everybody right. goes, yes, 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 yes. They're like, great. Set up time with us at 8.30 in the morning to show us two forms of ID and nine o'clock you have a job. So you can absolutely <laughs> set up a bespoke process. And we've got customers that routinely will go getting a job order on Friday to setting a hundred people at work on Monday morning. It is, but it is such a, for the corporate people who are hearing this, it is such a different world because of the, of the numbers. Yeah. Uh, you know, 700 people, a thousand, this, it's just, it's, it's different. And so your, your stack is a little bit different. Your process is a little bit different, but the, the emphasis around speed and automation is probably more heightened in an hourly or high volume environment than it is even in a corporate environment. Right. 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 It was a great question, by the way, Owen. Yeah. 
All right, William, here's a metrics question for you. Uh, what hiring conversion metrics should I be looking at today? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. So what hiring conversion metrics? I would look at offer letters uh, and look at the acceptance rates. So the, the thing that I, I'm most interested, you know, all of them are important. Everything in the funnel uh, conversions are going to be, you know, those that take the assessment, those that to do the background check all the way through your funnel. But once you get down to that moment where you send out the offer letters and your acceptance rate is below 80%, there's a problem. And what I mean by there's a problem is there's too much shock and awe in the offer letter. Like these, these are things that should, there should, you should have a hundred percent. You should have a higher than 80%, a hundred percent is probably too much, but you should have a higher percentage than 80% of your acceptance rate at offer level, because you've already discussed everything. Everything has already been hammered out. Comp's been hammered out. Remote hybrid's been hammered out. You know, the team's been hammered out. Career mobility has been hammered. Like all that stuff's been discussed. So there is no, there is no surprises, but right. I think we, oftentimes still think that the offer letter is a, a moment where we can do kind of the Moses coming down with tablets and surprising people with something. And there should be no surprises at the offer letter. So I, I would look at that, that metric or that conversion metric and as a, as, as a way of understanding the health of the pipeline and also what's going on. Because if you're below 80%, there's, there is, there's, a, there's a, a, absolutely a communications problem, but it could be deeper than that in that we've got the wrong people. We've got some fit problems. Yep. Yep. Makes sense. Um, Great question. All right, William, since we have a few minutes, I want to cover a couple of other topics on which I'm getting questions. One is, what are you seeing that works with job advertising? Uh, programmatic job advertising. Uh, what I love about programmatic ad, uh, job advertising is it has intelligence on where and how much. Like we don't have that intelligence, but a company that does pen, uh, you know, uh, that does programmatic advertising all the time is sitting on so much data that they can actually say, okay, you're looking for a full stack developer and uh, you want them to work remotely. Okay, here's how much that budget should be. It's a question mark. And, uh, and here's where we want to place that. So we want to place that across LinkedIn, uh, Stack Overflow, GitHub, this, that, the other. We're going to stagger these things across to be able to get the talent. So what works in job advertising for me is the intelligence of a Panda Lobby, a Symphony Talent, AppCast. There's a number of uh, recruiters. There's a number of these players but that works underneath that, the machine that's underneath it, that actually the more jobs they put on top of that, the more data that comes back, the, the, the finer the, 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 the actual request is. So we don't have that intelligence. We just basically say, oh, we'll put it on career builder, hope. And, and you know, like that's that. Well, that might be where the audience is or where the candidate pool is, or it might not. So we, we can get away from a lot of waste by using programmatic ad advertising because they're doing it every single day, every single hour. And the more they do it, the more refined it gets for us. So right. that's what works. All oh, right. Thank you. And yeah. in job ads in particular, adding specific comp uh, because of what LinkedIn, what, what Indeed, excuse me, is doing in terms of recommending salaries and also layering how they look at job descriptions and job ads. A job ad at Indeed right now is kind of framed in three different ways. With one with no salary is third. One with a band of salary is second. And then a specific salary is number one. Same job ad, same job description, but it's treated differently in Indeed in the search results. So um, the more we have a relationship with comp, our internal comp team, and again, using external comp data and internal comp data so that we can actually narrow cash like you did with that hourly position, $18.22. We need to be able to do that on the corporate side so that we get our job ads closer at search engine optimization so that we get our job ads closer to the top. 
I know we didn't okay. ask the comp question, but that's that's also something that's important. I love that. That's super specific. Um, all right, William, I'm going to try and combine a two-parter here because I had a question that I was going to ask you, which is how does one motivate my managers to care about internal mobility? <laughs> uh, and then we got a question right here in the chat from Abdullah again that says, are there any certifications that you recommend for upskilling? So, you know, I figured I'll ask them together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can't force a manager to care about something uh that, that's you know it's just like you learn this in life you can't force somebody to stop drinking you can't stop, force somebody to stop eating uh you just can't force people to do things uh so if the manager doesn't care um i think one of the things to sh to highlight to the to them is managers where they've been really successful of recruiting talent because they're a champion for them after so they look at talent. So like a Bill Belichick or Nick Saban in sports, they look at success by how many coaches that have been through the program and are how many players that, you know, for Nick, for how many players that go into the NFL or for, for Bill, how many, how many uh, uh, players are, are on other NFL teams that came through his system. Great managers look at talent that way. They basically say, I'm a, I'm a, a stop on your journey. While you're here with me, we'll do wonderful work and I will be a champion for you to do other things elsewhere and I'll take pride in you doing great things elsewhere. Bad managers are not that. They wanna, they wanna hoard, they found a good talent and they wanna hoard them. Problem with that is that great talent, especially now living in the era of transparency is like, yeah, I don't want that. I'm just gonna go elsewhere. And they feel like they have to go elsewhere to then get to a certain position. Uh, so I think I think the the question is, how do you change managers? I don't, I don't believe that you can change someone, but I think you can highlight the stories where other people are getting it right. And I think that's what the the job is: is just show, hey, Barbara over here, man, look at how many people have been through her department and are doing great work. And we should put an emphasis around Barbara. We should just tell Barbara's story, and that will. Uh, either motivate that person to change or not. Um, and the second question was around certifications. That's right. How, and, what do you recommend for upskilling? Oh boy, that's a great question. So upskilling, uh, again, highly individualized and personalized and first asking a question. So we tend to think of upskilling as it relates to the job. And uh, so if they're in a developer job, we want to upskill them you know, in the things that we care about. The, the movement that's happening in upskilling that I love is it's about the individual and what they want to be upskilled in. So they might be a developer, but they want to learn French. And so that's not necessarily in our, our interest. So we don't really look at that or think about that, but that's, it's, a, it's in our best interest in the sense of if we want to keep them, then we care. So we look at upskilling and training and development in a way of saying, okay, there are things that are company related and specific and how it will help you do their job. And then there's your human being. You're, and we want to make sure that you're happy and you're engaged. So what do you want to learn? So we, flip, we can flip skilling around and upskilling around on its head and just go, what do you want to learn? How do you want to learn? Now it becomes really interesting because we can even serve up recommendations like, hey, people that have worked in your job and uh, with your skill level, here's what they've done. So we can serve that up and show them, here's what, here's what skills that they've learned. You know, they took classes in negotiation. They did, they did this over here. And it's, it's not necessarily the thing linear in the way that we think of skills. Um, it's more based and should be based on what they want, what they desire. Makes sense. All right, William, we're 30 seconds from time. So first of all, thank you so much for making the time. Thank, no you, for, thank you for sharing these thoughts. And uh, for everybody, you know, who was listening, who gave us their time today, thank you very much. You know, couldn't have been a good conversation, but for all of your questions. Um, I just posted my email in the chat button. So in the chat box there, uh, if you have more questions, either for sense or for William, please, you know, feel free to send them over to us. We'll promise to get you, you know, answers or a quick response.
But again, everybody have a great afternoon. And thank you so much again. Can't wait for our next one. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers.